Hi, I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar, Storing Up Profits, Investing in Self-Storage. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with Paul, and he's going to give us uh, some great information that he's uh, gathered. Quick uh, disclaimer, uh, Camel Plan does not endorse anybody, you know, talk to your accountants, CPAs, uh, attorneys before making any investment. Uh, we're here to be a part of your, your team for alternative investments. This is my contact information for anyone that's looking to use retirement accounts, such as a self-directed IRA or solo 401k. Uh, contact me with any of those uh, questions. And without further ado, uh, this is a quick uh, information on Paul. He also just put out a new book and you can uh, mention that as well, Paul. And if you have any other questions that I can help you with, please feel free to reach out to me. I'll go ahead and uh, stop my share and you can take over, Paul. Thanks, right. for, th th thanks for being with us today, Paul. Hey, thank you, Ryan. Thanks, everybody. And I really appreciate it. I will try to get my screen working here. Hopefully it will. All right. Can you see that okay, Ryan? Yes, you're good. All right. Hey, I'm Paul Moore. And uh, I did write a book recently called Storing Up Profits, Capitalize on America's Obsession with Stuff by Investing in Self-Storage. And I am super grateful to be here with all of you. Um, I've... Uh, just a little bit about me. I've written three books on real estate investing. That's the latest, obviously. It just hit Amazon today. And so this is uh, real timely. Um, it's been on Bigger Pockets. It's available at biggerpockets.com slash storage or on Amazon. Uh, my previous book was on multifamily. And I promised my wife of 34 years now that uh, I would never do anything outside of multifamily. Multifamily is exciting. Multifamily is cool. Multifamily has all these value adds, but self-storage, boring. Seriously, I never imagined I would want to do something that boring. I mean, I used to invest in all kinds of exciting stuff like oil wells, and I remember, you know, a bunch of friends and I put about, I think it was like 1.1 million down in a hole in the ground and expected it to return like 10 million or 100 million in oil. And it returned exactly zero. And so um, I am, I have become a fan of boring. In fact, I did a talk last week in Orlando called The Joy of Being a Boring Investor. If you've ever studied Warren Buffett, like if you've read the book Snowball, his life story, you'll find out that he has lived the most boring, boring life imaginable. And a lot of great investors are really into this. Now I'm reading a book about some of the greatest investors in the world. Paul Samuelson wasn't an investor, but uh, he was the first U.S. winner of the Nobel Prize in economics. And he said investing should be like watching paint dry or watching grass grow. If you want excitement take $800 and go to Las Vegas. So self-storage, I mean, when I first heard about value adds and self-storage, I cracked up. I think I laughed out loud. Uh, I mean, I'm thinking about multifamily. I'd written a book called The Perfect Investment. I've talked about that here before, but I heard, you know, value adds and self-storage. We're talking about four pieces of sheet metal, uh, some rivets, a floor and a door. Value adds? Well, how are you going to value add there? I mean, apartments had lighting and, you know, that fake wood flooring and bark parks and paint and wallpaper and, you know, countertops and cabinets, all kinds of fun value adds. But what about self-storage? Well, I'll tell you what's not boring is the profits available in self-storage. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to first go over the economic benefits of self-storage. Then we're gonna talk about value adds in self-storage. We're gonna talk about how you can jump into self-storage if you choose to. And we're also gonna talk about who else is doing it. And then we'll end with three little brief case studies 
on self-storage. So self-storage is recession resistant. In good times, people are filling up their Walmart and Amazon carts. In bad times, they're you know, going through the four Ds, which include downsizing, death, divorce, dislocation. These are unfortunate, but they're real events that have been happening in the world since time began. And self-storage benefits in those times. Uh, the, the rents are inelastic, which means, I mean, look, if I have a thousand dollar apartment and my landlord raises at 6%, I might move out rather than pay that 60 bucks a month you know, I'm signing up for $720 a year, but in self storage, that $100 unit, if they raise it, the monthly rent by 6%, well, I'm probably not going to spend a weekend rent a U-Haul, get my friends together to move my stuff down the street to save six bucks a month, especially when I'm thinking, hey, um, I'm actually going to be out of here in a month or two anyway. And that's the beauty of this. There's this high switching cost. It's an emotional and mental cost and there's this perception that I'm only going to be here a short time. This is a fragmented industry. The number of operators in self-storage is about the same as McDonald's, Subway, and Starbucks combined. But the top three make, only, uh, make up only a small percentage of this. About three out of every four are run by independent operators. And about two-thirds of those independents are mom and pops, which means you can have a lot of, there's a lot of potential for value add, a lot of chance for uh, really making a lot of money in this business. It, there's a perception. Uh, in, in fact, when I sold my company to a public firm in 97, I thought, I'll just buy self-storage. It's just like a cash cow. And there, it is a cash cow for mediocre operators, but it's an actually pretty intense business uh, if you want to manage a great facility. And those are the types that we like to invest in. Here's an example of a value add you wouldn't see a mom and pop do. If you go into a mom and pop self-storage, you might see an old sheet of paper where literally it's a copy of a copy of like 10 copies of the price sheet and the number of units and the size. But in a, you know, in a in modern self-storage facility that's well run, I mean, they change the unit sizes, they change the pricing potentially daily. Uh, it's just like an airline or hotel. You might go in on a Tuesday and get a different price than if you went in on a Saturday. And that's a well-run facility. It's both a retail and a uh, real estate business. There's opportunities for significant ancillary income, like adding U-Haul, um, selling locks, boxes, tape, and scissors out of the showroom, expanding, adding you know, parking for RVs, boat storage, et cetera. There's a lot of upsides in that arena. And a lot of the best places you want to be now, it's too expensive to build new, which means the value add opportunity for existing uh, facilities is quite uh, strong. And a lot of these value adds are low cost. For example, adding U-Haul means signing a contract and letting them park uh, U-Hauls in front of your facility. Another thing I like is during this eviction moratorium, we learned that there was no eviction moratorium for self-storage and we actually have their stuff and they're usually going to pay their bill to get their stuff out uh, before it goes to the auction. The best business plan we know is buying from a mom and pop seller and upgrading, putting together a portfolio and selling to an institutional buyer. Last, oh, I, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, finish that thought. And then I just. Oh, I was, I was going to say too, that we love the fact that it's an inflation catcher. And we think it's the best inflation catcher in all of real estate. And what I mean by that is monthly lease. I mean, if you've got a 20 year lease on a factory or warehouse or office building that you own, you're set. I mean, you're not going to catch inflation. But in today's inflationary environment, look, I mean, self-storage catches it because we can raise rates every month if we choose to. Ryan? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, I meant to say this at the very beginning to let everybody know that there's a questions um, box and there's a chat. You can put it in either and Paul will uh, answer any questions that anybody has on any of these topics. But Funny enough, we, when you said the locks, because I mean, 
I think probably everybody on here has probably been in the process of uh, using storage at some point. Yeah. But, but I, uh, I thought that was funny that you mentioned that because they were like, they're like, you know, you have to have an approved mm-hmm. lock, right? Like their, their approval of the lock. And it's like, yeah. okay, well then I'll just buy your lock. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, right. it's like too easy just to, you know, not do something like that. So, yeah. And you know what? That's one thing. It's funny that we talk about that, but there is a reason for that. The locks that they put on the certain type of locks, like not the old fashioned padlocks we saw in, you know, junior high school, mm-hmm. but the locks they have now are uh, like impenetrable. I mean, I heard of some guy tested it and he had all this equipment. He was trying to cut a lock off. He couldn't do it. And so it's, it, it helps with the theft issue as well, helps their reputation. Uh, self-storage has had amazingly low um, mortgage delinquency. I mean, that's the orange line down below with the overall uh, delinquency above. You can see through the Great Recession, it was only a fraction of uh, commercial mortgage-backed security delinquency rates. Uh, mobile home parks and multifamily were quite similar to this. So we love all three of those asset types. Uh, Self-storage has had much better annual returns in the REIT world from 94 to 2017. Um, I will say that part of the benefit of self-storage, I mean, I'm just going to be honest here, is part of that is, I think, because self-storage just roared out of nowhere. And so REITs that picked it up, you know, had a much better opportunity. And that's the same opportunity we have buying from a mom and pop now, just on a different scale. Speaking of mom and pops, I mean, look on the right here. I told my wife I was going to do multifamily forever, but I couldn't find any deals. 93% of multifamily over 50 units are owned by companies who have multiple assets, and they've usually bled uh, the value add out of these. But self-storage, again, it's like three quarters owned by independent operators, so there's a lot of potential upside. Uh, Self-storage and mobile home parks did better than anybody in net operating income growth. Since the Great Recession, uh, they're projected to do better than any manufactured homes are actually first. Healthcare and self storage are tied for second. Uh, I mentioned the business plan of putting together a portfolio. I mean, it's widely known that putting together a portfolio can get you a premium. I just got a wire this morning from a company we invested with, and they they sold 26 of their self-storage facilities. They put together, you know, mostly all from mom and pops. They upgraded them. They put one flag on them, one franchise name, one pr- property management system, and then they sold this and recapitalized it actually to a large private equity group. And they got a premium because, again, it's a lot better to sell a whole portfolio because of these private equity groups. They were looking to write a 70, I think it was a $76 million check. They weren't looking to write, you know, a three or five or $10 million check. And so that's why uh, we love this. Why is Jeff Bezos here? Ryan, you might ask. Well, the answer is because he knows the power of $1. Uh, Last I checked, Amazon's price to earnings ratio was about 60. So if he can save a dollar a month, that's $12 a year. That's 700, uh, excuse me, $12, a dollar a month. That's $12 a year. That's $720 in his stock price. That's real money for just a dollar. He went around and took the light bulbs out of the vending machines at the Amazon facilities in the US. He didn't think it was worth it advertising Lance snacks. Well, in the same way, a dollar, because he because he knows the value of a dollar, in the same way, a dollar in self-storage is a very powerful thing because of this thing called the value add, the value formula, okay? So we think this is why most of the Forbes 400 wealthiest people in the world invest in commercial real estate, and in this case, specifically in self-storage because of this value formula. Now you can write this down, I didn't put this in here, but the value formula is value equals net operating income divided by cap rate. And that's the rate of return. We can go over that in the Q&A if you want. So a dollar added to the bottom line in a commercial real estate facility, like a self-storage facility, it's $12 annually. (laughs) Ryan, my mom told me I was good in math. That proves it right there. Uh, $12 $12 
divided by the cap rate of 0.06. That's $200 in added asset value. Now that's real money. Now with leverage, like 60% LTV leverage, $200 in asset value can actually be like a 2.5x impact on equity. And so I probably threw a lot at you right there. So let's just go over some quick examples. So I'll do the math on one or two of these, and then you can just work out the rest yourself. So imagine 40, 40 vacant units being filled at $125 a unit. Well, that's 40 times $125 times 12 months. That's $60,000 added to the net operating income. But divide 60,000 by the cap rate of, let's say 6%, 0.06, that's a million dollars added to the value. So if you can buy a self-storage or invest in a self-storage facility with you know, 40 vacant units, you can potentially add a million dollars to the value just by filling those units. Let's say you raise the rent by only 10%. That's 1250 a unit. That's 1250 a month times 500 units in your facility. That's 1.25 in added value, 1.25 million. Spend $100,000 to add a paid billboard. Well, that's $2,000 a month lease. That's $24,000 a year or $400,000 added to your value. Now you just spent $100,000 to add $400,000 to the value. You can do that with a lot of other things like cell towers, ATMs, propane filling stations, all kinds of things you can add. Uh, U-Haul is another example. $3,000 a month in income would translate to $36,000 a year or $600,000 in added value to the property. You could add point of sale items like the locks Ryan was talking about, a thousand a month, even a thousand a month translates to $200,000 in added value to the facility. Uh, add insurance and late fees. And that would be, uh, in this example, that would be uh, $500,000 in value. Uh, reduce expenses. We did that at a facility recently. $50,000 reduction is $833,000 in added value of the facility. Add 100 climate controlled units and you lease those for $175 a unit. Well, that is big money. Divide that by 6% by 12 months. That's $3.5 million in added value. And part of the benefit of that is because the land is free. So if you could do everything on this page, you could add 497,000 a year to your bottom line, which translates to $8.2 million in added value. So if you paid $10 million for that facility and you had only 4 million in equity, and 6 million in debt, you know, that's a four, what, 60% LTV, like I mentioned before. Okay, you have 4 million in equity, you just added $8 million to the value of the facility. If you sell it, or you could refinance it, you could actually, you basically just tripled the value of your equity, because you added 8 million to 4 million. So your 4 million is now worth 12 million, you still have 6 million in debt. And so it's a powerful opportunity to build wealth. The question is, should you do this by yourself? Or you even do it on a smaller scale, like maybe buy a million dollar facility? Or should you do it with partners? And that's a question everybody's got to answer. I spent a lot of my book, the last third of my book trying to answer that question. Uh, so I'm going to talk about something. I talked about this in New Orleans at the Bigger Pockets Conference. And I think I confused some people. So I want to make clear what I'm talking about. Value add investing means adding value to get like adding a valuable change to your facility to get a higher value of the property. I like to think of it more as intrinsic value extraction, commercial real estate owners, people that buy a mom and pop self storage facility have this intrinsic value that the operator can see when they acquire it from a mom and pop operator. And when they extract that intrinsic value, they're able to significantly increase the value of the equity like we just talked about. So let's talk about intrinsic value extraction example number one. This is in Grand Junction, Colorado. It was acquired in November 8 of 2018 for 4.3 million, about half debt, half equity. Uh, it had 71,000 square feet. 
114 RV spaces. The net operating income was just under 300,000. Now check this out. You read that right, 80% occupancy, which isn't horrible for a mom and pop facility, but it had 80% delinquency. Why? Well, the owner drove everybody crazy. He or she, I won't mention which, was neurotic. Uh, he or she called my friend who was buying this at like four in the morning and she would talk to him. Oops, I said she. She would talk to him for like two hours at a time about all her fears about selling. Well, she had customer service issues, deferred maintenance issues, rents were below market. It was just so much drama. An institutional buyer never would have put up with this. A broker wouldn't have put up with it, but my friend did. Well, um, about six months into it, six months into it, he already had, after he acquired it, he already had the net operating income up from under 300 to 456,000, which translates to a $2.3 million increase in projected value. Now look at my first line, top right. There was only 2.15 million in equity in this. He had more than, more than doubled the appraised equity, if you will, within six months. And this is the power of buying self-storage from a mom and pop seller. He's projecting a 47% IRR and 4.2 multiple on invested capital. And you can see why, because he already had it up to a, like a two point, I think one X multiple, at least on paper within six months. And now we're uh, exactly three years in. So this is the facility. Like I said, kind of boring, but the profits aren't boring, right? So intrinsic value extraction example number two in Oregon, this is one that actually went full cycle. It was also acquired in 2018. We invested in this one as well. It's a mom and pop seller, nothing really wrong. They were just retiring and they hadn't raised rents in a long time. It was 20% below market. Great location. You guys have probably heard a lot of people are moving out of the cities in Washington and Oregon, and they're moving into the central Oregon area. Almost 100% occupancy, the, our operator raised the rates by 26%, got delinquency down real low. Uh, the uh, cash on cash now is flowing at 23%, well, at least till it was sold. It was sold recently for 3.22 million. The net profit on that was $1.7 million. So it was acquired for 1.7, and the value was doubled. But remember with leverage, doubling the value, actually it was even better than that. It was a 4.3 uh, X multiple on invested capital. So this is the facility there in Oregon. Again, nothing really exciting. Example number three, security mini storage. This is in Beeville, Texas. And my business partner flew down to see this before we invested. I uh, was acquired for cash of $2.4 million and it was marketed. Uh, it had been marketed at five and a half million, but these five siblings were fighting. And when my uh, operating partner offered 2.4 million cash, they jumped on it. They closed quickly. They had 90% occupancy going in 91, but um, 60 of the units were actually delinquent. There was no website didn't need a website. They were almost, you know, they were doing fine without it in their mind, I guess. This is a mom and pop thinking. The rents were 20 to 30% below market. The rent, the expenses were very high. They were paying themselves really well. Uh, in about, say, actually four months, they had, I think, 320 move-ins, two rate increases, U-Haul, other streams added. Uh, the occupancy was maintained. Delinquent tenants were uh, auctioned off. The appraisal in just four months was $4.6 million. And that's the first time they got debt on it because it had been acquired for cash. They got $4 million in debt, leaving only, uh, a, excuse me, $2 million in debt, leaving only about half a million dollars in equity in the deal. Uh, so the new debt was added. And when it was sold about a year ago, the internal rate of return on that was 70 0.5% and the multiple on invested capital. Remember, there was very little equity left in it. That's one of the tricks of this. It was 4.6X. So a 360% return to the investors in just uh, two years. This one is a little more exciting, but it is in a 
small town, like I said, Beeville, Texas, 12,000 people, and it worked this well. So it's pretty exciting. This asset class, if you all haven't heard, has been written up in the Wall Street Journal. Self-storage has been written up in uh, New York Times. Uh, it's been written up as the best performing asset class since COVID. And we went over some reasons why, but it's really true. Bill Gates has jumped in, whether you like or hate Bill Gates, he's jumped in to uh, self-storage. Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway has joined in the self-storage arena as well. So has Blackstone. Blackstone has jumped in. In fact, Blackstone invests alongside of us. Well, I guess we should say we invest alongside Blackstone uh, with uh, in a large self-storage portfolio based in West Palm Beach. Um, and we were down there. I was actually in West Palm Beach two weeks ago, and uh, we invest alongside Blackstone there. As we talk, as we land this plane, Ryan, we're going to talk about how to get into self-storage because a lot of people probably wonder, well, I mean, I'm not ready to buy a $10 million facility. I'm not ready to go out and even buy a $1 million facility. I don't know how to do it. Well, if you want to learn how to do it, read my book. All right, that's a joke. Seriously, um, you can get the book and it can probably guide you in to some ideas. But like I said, I spent the last third of the book and I concluded with this thought. I'd rather earn 1% off 100 people's efforts than 100%. I think that was a typo in there, John D. Rockefeller. He might've been the wealthiest guy in history of the US, but I don't think he said this right. I'd rather uh, earn 1% off 100 people's efforts than 100% of my own efforts. Okay, John, you're fine. He's a smart guy. I'm just teasing. Uh, there's seven paths to success in self-storage. And like I said, the last third of my book goes over these seven paths in detail. So path one is stacking which is kind of a misnomer, but it's used a lot on bigger pockets. Um, stacking means basically you buy one, you fix it up, you rent it out, you increase the income, you sell it, you can refinance it, and then you buy the next one and you buy a larger one. And then you do it again, you buy a larger one. You just keep working your way up. And I've seen people do this really successfully. A second path to get into self-storage would be to raise capital. Just be a capital raiser. You can't do this legally unless you follow very, very strict SEC guidelines. You might have to become a broker dealer or be a principal in the deal. And uh, so capital raising is a second path to get in. A third path is a deal finder. And that means you go out and find the deals and you would feed those to a self-storage operator. I've done this in, you know, on the side. Last year I did a, uh, I did one asset last year and I made a pretty good chunk of change. I'm working on one in Kansas this year. It's supposed to close by the end of the year. So a nice way to get into the business. Uh, for me, it was a side thing. But if you want to get into self-storage, being a capital raiser or deal finder and feeding that money or those deals to a larger operator is definitely a legitimate way in. Another way to get in for you Cama plan IRA investors who have made millions and millions of dollars is just start out big. You could just go big. And it's the kind of business you could, if you can get a great team around you, great asset manager, great property management team, et cetera, you can go big. Um, I would recommend getting some experienced people on your team though. Another path, especially if you're younger, is to get a job. And you might say, well, I, wait a minute, I, I came to Cama Plans and I want to be in real estate because I want to get out of my job. I get that. But a lot of people jump in and they become an asset manager, a property manager, a commercial real estate broker, a commercial lender, or even like a financial analyst or even a maintenance person, especially if you're younger, uh, you might want to consider doing that at a self-storage facility and that be your path in. Um, taking the passive path is another way to go. And that is what I do. And that is basically, I find the very, very best operators I can, and I invest heavily with them. And again, that goes back to the Rockefeller quote, that it's better to be part of a big team, a, a better team, and just get better people around you. And that's what I do. The last path is find a mentor or a paid coach. And if anybody wants to reach out to me, 
Uh, I don't do any coaching, of course, but I do recommend um, other people in the coaching world that would be a great coach if you want to get involved in self-storage. Speaking of reaching out to me, you can uh, you should definitely reach out to Ryan and their team at Cama Plans if you want more information. But if you want to reach out to me directly, there's a quick uh, screen you can take a screenshot of there. We'd love to have you come and join us uh, or meet with us if we can help you in any way. I've got an um, e-course. There's an audio of this book, Storing Up Profits. I also have an audio and a written e-course you can go through to learn more. Uh, and if you want to get a special report on self-storage investing, you can get that at wellingscapital.com. That's my company name. It's not Wellington. I shouldn't have named it that, should I? Anyway, Ryan, it's wellingscapital.com slash resources. And you can get a special report on self-storage, another one on mobile home park investing, and then some other stuff there. So I am wrapping up, landing this plane, and ready for some questions. Ryan, what do you think? Yes, abs abs absolutely. Um, and I appreciate all that information. It was great. And I encourage people to uh, ask questions if they have them now or to reach out to you. I didn't see any questions come through. That's While we're just, waiting for the that's, questions, that's, check that's, this out, Ryan. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just trying to kind of save face here since we get any questions. Ten. This is a legitimate ten million dollar bill. Why do I have ten million dollar bills from Zimbabwe? <laughs> well, let the us answer, know. The answer is because we are experiencing the highest level of inflation since uh -huh. the year I graduated from high school. And you're probably thinking to yourself. He probably graduated from high school in the 90s. Stop, <laughs> you're making me blush. No, seriously, I graduated in 82 from high school. And this is the largest <laughs> inflation we've had since 1982. This just came out. A lot of you probably saw this. It's pretty serious. And the reason I love self-storage as an inflation hedge is number one, what I said already, which is it can catch inflation. <laughs> Because rates can go, you can rise, you know, raise rates as inflation goes up. But a second reason I love it is because the debt on these self-storage facilities right now, it's because the delinquency rates are so low. I mentioned that earlier. The debt is fabulous. You can get a 3% loan on a self-storage facility. Imagine locking in a 3% loan, sometimes interest only for like 12 years but then catching yeah. all this type of inflation for 12 years, or at least as long as this inflation runs hot. Can you see the power in this? It's, it's abs huge. Abs abs absolutely. And people don't want to move and they think they're only going to be there for a few months and then it's a few years, you know, crazy. Um, but someone True. did, did ask um, a question. How do you evaluate operators, Paul? Yeah. We have a 26, now 28 point criteria um, list that we go through. Mm -hmm. And we want to see, you know, how many years of experience they have. Tell me about, we want to find out about their team. We want to do a background check, reference check, criminal check. We want to do what we lovingly call death by Google. We want to look everywhere we can on Google and put their name with you know, SEC violation, scam, um, you know, pyramid scheme. I mean, we do all kinds of different searches. Uh, we also drop in on their facilities. I mentioned we invest with a company in West Palm Beach. Well, we dropped in on six of their facilities uh, one day in Michigan. We just went from one to the other and just dropped in, secret shopped, all that stuff. And um, so we do that. We, we see how the owners and the key management team talk about their investors, talk about their spouse, talk about their employees, speak to the, you know, waiter or waitress. We just want to see what kind of people these are, uh, you know, and, you know, I mean, every time you invest, there's going to be problems. And the question is, do you want to be in a problem investment for 10 years if it, you know, if it's a problem? Do you want to be in with this person and this team for 10 years? Because you're basically talking about a five or 10 year marriage 
when you uh, invest in commercial real estate because there's a liquidity issue. It's not a liquid investment like stocks and bonds, right, Ryan? Yeah, no, ab ab absolutely, I agree. Um, so we have a few other questions here if you have time, Paul. Um, what is the biggest advice for finding new deals? Do you use a specific platform or is it all networking? Yeah. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to answer a question that they didn't ask first. We do use a specific platform to evaluate deals. And the, that uh, a lot of that is um, uh, it's, it's radius plus. And the book goes in my special report in the book, go into a lot of detail about that whole thing. But as far as how to find the deals, the only ways I've seen that work really, really well to find these value add deals are to go off market with your own uh, systematic approach to calling and emailing and texting and writing to um, owners and even driving up and talking with the owners. You can drive up to one of the facilities. You can, uh, you know, you can walk in, ask for the owner, meet with them and uh, hopefully get a, an opportunity to see if they want to sell their facility. But the most effective strategy we've ever seen, this may be depressing to some of you, but is actually uh, a guy in Nevada with a team of seven people who work the phones and computers full time. And they call these owners probably an average of four times a year. In other words, they might have a thousand people on each one of their lists. They call it, they call them, you know, quarterly. So it's a lot of work to do it right. Uh, I'll say the next question, but I think you just obviously answered that. Are you buying mainly off-market properties? And then how do you identify potential mom and pop sellers? Yeah, great questions. So um, I would say that 92% uh, of our, lar oh, sorry, so our largest operator we invest with uh, that we've been with for three years. We've invested 38 million with them. Uh, they do 92% off market. And so the question on and how to, uh, how to find, um, how to find mom and pop sellers. Well, first of all, um, they, on, they have a really bad website or they don't have a website at all. Um, they're virtually hundred percent occupied. And they say, well, I, I don't need to do marketing. Why, why would I need to? I'm almost 100% occupied. That's, it's not always that way. Some of them are 50% occupied. But again, you look for things like both of those situations. Their rents are way under market. Uh, they don't use dynamic pricing. Uh, they don't have a quality. Um, they don't have a quality team. I kid you not. I drove by a self-storage facility in Fairbanks, Alaska last year when I was up there doing that one deal I told you I did last year myself. Mm -hmm. And it had a sign out there. It was hard to read, but I called the number on the sign. <clears throat> I kid you not. It said, this is Susie's mobile massage uh, therapy. I, and I hung up. I thought, oh, I dialed the wrong number. I dialed it again. It was. It was the same number. Susie's mobile massage if I'm not picking up, I'm probably doing a massage somewhere in the woods in Alaska. Leave me a message and I'll get back to you within a week. Well, I mean, that's, that's mom and pop, right? Okay, so you get the idea. We're just looking for stuff like that. You know, people who don't have a showroom, people who don't do U-Haul, people who don't do all kinds of things that could be done to maximize income. Great. Uh, got another two for you, but I'll do this one first. Do you focus on areas slash markets where rents are high or where you have found low self storage, um, or both? The rents are all relative. So, I mean, we could, I've got a friend who, um, is doing self storage and he's actually doing like downtown, um, big cities, like, you know, like the kind of compete with the large public storage you see everywhere. He's doing it right down there and they might be 250 a month, you know, for a unit. 
And then we've got other facilities that are like Ishpeming, Michigan. You know, it's a town of like under 10,000 people and got over, uh, four, I think it's 1,400 storage units there. It draws from the whole area and the rents are low, but it works really, really well also. So the answer to both questions, number one is, yeah, it could be high or low rent. And we're looking for places that are underserved. And sometimes they might be fully served, but they might be underserved with a certain type. Like it might have all kinds of old, um, regular self-storage units, but we bring in a climate controlled facility and that will just meet that demand in that area. We did that in Minnesota. In fact, we invested in a deal near Minneapolis that was all beautiful, new climate controlled in an area that didn't have that. Wow. Um... And I think we can probably wrap up after this, but any recommendations for operators slash syndication companies? And that's probably right up your alley. Yeah, um, we only recommend operators that we fully vet. And we actually typically would give that out with an NDA, with a non-disclosure agreement. So if people be so kind if you're serious about investing in this, please get hold of me. Um, there's the contact information or get hold of Ryan. He'll pass it along to us. And um, we will be glad to share that information uh, with people. We do, that's what we do professionally. My company, Wellings Capital, vets and invests with a diversified group of operators in self-storage and other asset types. Awesome. Well, I appreciate all the information that you gave us today. Uh, glad to have you here, uh, Paul. And if there's anything that anybody has uh, other questions on, feel free to contact me or Paul with your questions. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Ryan, it's been great to be on these six or so episodes with you. And I really, really appreciate you having me on today. And I wish everybody a wonderful holiday season. Absolutely. Same as well. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Take care. Yep. Bye-bye.